Okay, Rachel, welcome to my show. Um, can we just start by describing um, well, your name and uh, what you do? I'm Rachel, I am a sleep therapist. Okay. I've been doing it for um, a long time in the NHS and recently started out privately, which is why I'm here. Fantastic. Okay, uh, so a sleep therapist, can you describe what a, a sleep therapist does? A sleep therapy is a holistic assessment of the client, so taking into consideration their lifestyle factors, any simple reasons why they might not be sleeping, and going all the way through to some more in-depth nighttime anxieties as to why. They're maybe going to sleep okay, but waking up overnight and not being able to get themselves back to sleep. Okay, so the sleep therapy is something you offer to people not necessarily they don't fall asleep, is more for people who are getting up at night or waking up at night and can't go back to sleep. That seems to be the more typical client. There are definitely adults and children who struggle to fall asleep initially, hmm. but a lot of people don't realise they've got a sleep problem because they fall asleep fine at night and then can't continue that throughout the duration of the night. Okay, great. And so when these people have a sleeping problem, it means they sleep, how many, how many hours somebody sleeps when they, they, they come to you because they have a sleeping problem? A lot of people are actually starting to go to bed too early, I'm right. finding, in practice, because okay. they are desperate to get a certain length of sleep mm -hmm. that they feel they need, but actually their anxieties are increasing because they are going to bed too early and then possibly can't fall asleep, or they are going to bed early because they're exhausted and then don't maintain that through the night so on average people are probably getting more like sort of four or five hours of sleep but clients are very very variable which is too little to four or five hours everybody's different mm -hmm. but the average recommendation is somewhere between seven to eight hours seven eight okay yeah. right okay so you said you've been doing this for a long time uh, at NHS. You more recently started in private practice, and that's why we are we are having this conversation. Can you just describe um, how you got into this particular therapy, sleep therapy? Um, yeah, yeah. As my role um, well within the NHS, I've been a health visitor for the last five years of my work in the NHS, and right. that is very much focusing on children's development. Sleep is a huge part of normal development, yep. and that's an area that parents were really struggling with, and it's also an area that I found that I really enjoyed helping with, so okay. it was a natural development for me to um, then say, okay, this is an aspect of my work that I could offer. Great. Because there's a need. Okay, but, um, not but, um, so parents come to you, they have children aged between... Um, any age, any age. Parents don't actually see an older child with a sleep problem so much as, as regarding it as a, as a sleep problem. Mm. They, they tend to focus on the babies that don't sleep. Yes. Um, so when they've got maybe a primary age child that isn't sleeping, they're not necessarily thinking it's a sleep problem, they're thinking it's an anxiety or the child doesn't need as much sleep. So they're not necessarily identifying. Right. Especially some of our teenagers. So... Um, a, parent, a typical parent that would come to me would have a younger child, but then might also discuss age, an older one. Age, age three, four? Um, anywhere from about seven months upwards. Right. See, so um, toddlers, really, babies still. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so when you, and I guess when you're working with people who are, well, parents who have children of that age, is very different than working with an individual which could be in their 30s, 40s, 50s with, this, with, with a sleeping problem. It's a different approach, but yeah. the actual basics behind it are very similar. So oh, you're okay. still looking at a behavioural intervention to help that sleep. So an education process, so that could be a parent or an adult with a sleep problem. Yeah. Educating why what we do in the day is quite important for our night times. Mm. And also then some techniques to help them either keep their child in bed or keep themselves in bed. Oh, fantastic. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay, that's uh, very. We're gonna go in more. I'm, I'm usually I'm waiting until we talk about your practice, but this is very fascinating for me. Um, um, so you've been in the NHS for a long time. So you were doing something different within the NHS before. Yeah, I started in 1997, 
comes wow. straight out of university okay. into um, hematology role, so that's very much in the lab. Yes. So I was there, ooh, did a good 10 odd years. Yes. That then felt that I actually really enjoyed the client contact. Yes. So I retrained as a midwife and did both okay. for a little bit. So while I was training as a midwife, I was still doing shifts as a hematologist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So you deliver yeah. lots of babies then? Yes, 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 did. yes. Okay, yeah. so, so I did yeah. midwifery for uh, again a good sort of five years, and okay. then realised that actually, as my own children had started school, yeah. the nights and the shifts and the weekends were becoming a little bit more tricky to manage. Yes, so I went into a more nine to five role, which is what health visiting is. And the health visiting is public health nursing, so it is child development and technically all the way up to the age of nineteen. Oh. Great. Okay. Very, very interesting. Okay. So can you explain uh, if there is a link between your past experience? So you, you, so you, you studied, uh, you, you, so your career was meant to go into a lab initially, then you, you became a, a nurse midwife. And how did the, the transition between uh, basically helping women to deliver babies into the sleeping, how was the, 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 the trip, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the, tra the journey, the transition, yeah. yes. Um, it was a very gradual one. It came about because, uh, I mean, uh, being a midwife is a very physical job and very physiological, but actually there's a huge amount of emotions involved in that. Right. And as a, as a new parent, so it's a, almost an overwhelming experience having delivered a baby and then suddenly being responsible for this tiny thing that mm -hmm. nothing about. Yes. So it was all of that emotional support around that mm. and then knowledge, so helping those parents then realise that actually, you know, we're in charge of this baby, the baby wasn't scary, uh, developing that side of those parenting skills and that found... I found that very enjoyable, that side of that education mm -hmm. side of it. And that all then links on to sleep. So if you can educate a parent on what would be normal sleep for a child at any given age, yes. you can then help them with some very simple techniques to keep that on track. So it was a very organic process. In, and new parents were obsessed with their baby sleep. <laughs> so that's a big yeah. topic that we always discuss anyway. They, they all worried... Uh, Yes, so of course, some people have uh, babies that just sleep all the time, and people and other people have <laughs> babies that don't yeah. sleep. So I guess the second part, the second group of people are the ones that uh, seek help yeah. much more, like like professionals like yourself. Okay, so now let's talk. So you you've been doing this for at the NHS. So at the NHS, you got like a, a clinical work I guess people come and see you book an appointment refer to GPs and is that the way it works um well health visiting is a very unique service at the NHS office mm. because we are the only service that sees every family in their own home no other family does that I see. so we see everybody anybody who's had a baby will see a health visitor within two weeks of that baby being born so it's a unique opportunity to deliver public health advice to give advice around um, routine what is normal what is child development right so we see absolutely everybody and we then offer ongoing service to those that really need it i see okay so that's where that part of it goes great okay so let's now talk about uh, the this is your job now let's talk about your practice so how <laughs> did the idea of the of offering um sleep therapy to to the general population in private practice came about um it it very much from the health right. side of it in that when I was seeing mothers for low mood perhaps because that's part of my role yeah. um, we would discuss about how much sleep they were getting because that's very crucial in anxiety and depression is, is your overnight stresses and sleep mm -hmm. and it was very much seemed to be stemmed for those mothers that were either particularly anxious or very low yes. did have children that didn't sleep so they weren't getting a night's sleep at all which meant they couldn't then function properly in the day and couldn't regulate their emotions and their mood. So it's a vicious so circle, basically. Very much a vicious circle. So it started by, instead of looking at what was going on for mum, I started, I started working on what we could do with the baby, which would then help the mother. Yeah. As, and that's where it came from. Okay, that's great. And I guess 
you were also, as it happens to quite a few people um, which uh, were working or are working at the NHS, the demand becomes so much greater than what your service within the NHS can offer. So you say, okay, there is a scope for me to do it privately. Is that yeah. the way it went? Yeah, very much. People were wanting um, a bit more individual mm-hmm. time yes. that, that I could offer on yes. the NHS and also much more targeted support. Yeah. So I try and price myself very reasonably so mm. I'm accessible to a, a wide range of parents and that seems to be working. It seems to be working. That's great. Okay. Um, so when you decided to start doing it in private practice, was there anything, um, was there a big challenge involved or was it a fairly smooth process? Um, for me, I had to overcome the obstacle of actually charging people for my work. Yeah. That's <laughs> Which, a... after 22 years of the NHS, felt very, very strange to actually... Ask for money. Ask for money and have someone um, think they've paid for this service. Yes. So that was a big um, psychological barrier for me to actually then. So I I spent many months doing it for free. (laughs) Because I just didn't feel comfortable charging people. Yes, it's a very common. What you're telling me is absolutely very common to a lot of people. I have a lot of people who are either still working between NHS and here. Uh, or they, you know, they recently left NHS for a reason or the other, and uh, you know, they find it extremely difficult to price themselves properly. Yes, absolutely. Um, so, within your past experience in your personal development uh, as a as a professional, as you are at the moment, was there one person that had uh, most influence in in this development? I had a long a long think about this particular question. Yes. Um, and it goes down to, I think, I mean, there have been various people over the years, but one particular um, colleague who was my manager at the time mm-hmm. um, was, um, and we used to meet up regularly because as you do in practice, and yeah. she just taught me a very valuable lesson that I wasn't actually responsible for everything and everybody that I came into contact with. Yes. And that was, it was, it was quite a relief actually to realise that yes, I had a role and I had a responsibility to deliver my work correctly, mm. but I then wasn't responsible for what the client went and did with that knowledge or whether they put it into practice or whether they felt that it wasn't right for them at the time. And right. That, that was a very valuable lesson to learn. And it's also made me realise that actually I can deliver a message and I can support somebody, yeah. but they have to be in the right frame of mind to accept that message and for it to work for them yeah so I then I actually then went on and did a bit of a course on motivational interviewing so I could then get a grasp of where the client was in their journey of wanting to change things yeah yeah I guess is the you the old saying you know you can bring a horse to the water you can't make it drink you know it's just uh, I guess when you work at this level it's it's fairly common that people you know or either they they know better than you, so they come to you for advice. You give them advice, and then they say, "Well, well me it wouldn't work," or these sort of things. Yeah, I've tried I, that. I've tried this. I tried this, yeah. and it doesn't work, so <laughs> I'm not going to try. Um, yeah, sometimes it's very difficult. I I appreciate. Okay, do you remember in your personal development as a as a practitioner, as a as a professional in this field, a particular mistake more painful than others? Um. From a personal point of view, I mean, me and my husband used to be foster carers, oh, right. and um, which we enjoyed and we were very keen to do, um, but at the time, I think about three years ago now, we decided that actually it was putting a lot of strain on our own children, our own family life, Yes. and that we made the decision to stop, and that still feels a very painful decision because we went into it really wanting to make a difference and make a change. Yes. So to then realise that we weren't actually able to sustain that was quite hard. Mm. Wow, that's a, that's a mission of life <laughs> on its own. Yeah. Wow, okay. Is there anything you would like to change in your past as a, pers- as a professional development? Um, yeah, yeah, I would say when I was... When I was um, Younger, I was absolutely adamant that I wanted to be a vet. I oh, see. worked and worked and worked to get my A levels, and finally got a much wanted place in Birmingham College. And then discovered that London life as a 
just turned 18 year old was just too fascinating and didn't put in anything like the amount of work I should have done when I got there so I then only managed one year before and they said no sorry you're not passing the exams well oh, enough um, <laughs> so with vetus. hindsight yes I would have loved to have to be aware. At, at least at least completed the course and then made a decision yeah but um then I wouldn't be here now so there's always pros and cons to everything that happens to us in life Okay, uh, do you remember within uh, your current practice if there was a, um, a proudest moment, like maybe one particular client that you, you, you felt so proud of the difference you managed to make in this person? Um, in terms of sleep therapy, I mean, every time somebody um, sends me an email back saying, well, actually, it's getting much better and it's working, that, and that's a wonderful feeling. Yeah. In terms of what we used to do as a, as a foster carer, we got a text out of the blue um, from one young mum that we'd had, who'd had mm. her baby with us for six months. Okay. Um, it was fairly challenging at the time. Wow. Um, but sent a text a year later saying, thank you so much. You know, you've, you've been, you've, because of you, I've managed to keep my baby and we're doing okay. And it was a totally random text, but it, it really wow. made a big difference. Fantastic. Um, do you remember if there was a, a key point when you decided that sleep therapy was uh, the direction to go? Yeah, it was something that I've been mulling over for a long time, actually. I mean, which aspects of my work could, could I develop? Yes. So it, that was a natural one because I'm, I absolutely love it. Mm. Um, but yeah, I would say this time last year, um, Easter, I was on holiday with my family and had a chance to read loads more around the subject, it was yes. really relaxing, and I just thought, you know what, I'd look much wiser to be in control of my own working life, to yes. be able to have a few more holidays with the family, or, yes, or at least yeah, take some of time off. So that was, that was it for me about a year ago, I thought, right, I'm going to make a go of this. Okay. We already mentioned at the beginning, but can you explain in a few words how your therapy works? Yeah, yeah, it, it really is a total overall assessment of the client, their wishes, their aspirations, what's going on for them personally at the moment, what's gone on for them in the past. Mm -hmm. um, so not necessarily a, an in-depth therapy as such, but overall, yeah. overall um, what has brought the client. Yeah. To see me at this moment in time, and then a good understanding um, of the, the actual sleep process, what they need to have in place for their bodies to actually naturally fall asleep. Okay. So a bit more of an education process, and then a sort of exploration of what might be stopping that from happening. You know, the lifestyle factors, stress, um, what's going on for them at home. You know, is the bedroom environment suitable? So all of those sort of all encompassing factors and then some strategies and techniques to help them actually mm. cope with insomnia. A lot of it comes from an acceptance point of view to begin with. Yes. So this is where you are at the moment, but it doesn't necessarily mean to say it's going to stay like this. Yeah. I'm working on some techniques to help them overcome that fear of actually not being asleep. Mm. So the way you're describing it sounds like your first session must be a very long yeah. uh, assessment. General, well, generally, I can manage to do it in one session. <laughs> the so whole I, process. Yeah, so I tend to offer a two-hour session to begin with. Right. Um, offer a load of strategies that are tailored for the clients. Yeah. Ask them to go away, see what they can take from that. Yes. And then if they need to, I then either offer some email or support after that. Or if they want to, they can come back and book another one-hour session. But the initial session actually covers so much that generally people feel that they can make the changes they need. Wow. <laughs> I, I was expecting <laughs> sleep therapy to be like an ongoing process for weeks and end. Well, I think once people have the tools and the knowledge, yes. it's actually up to them to make those changes. So unless I was actually sat beside them as they were going to sleep. No, of course not. Yeah. Um, they have to take some responsibility and take some mm. control over that process themselves. Okay. So, yeah, so they okay. do tend to manage to do it themselves. Wow, oh, fantastic. Um, so, just to clarify, people come to you for a session in a clinic like this one, 
Uh, you're not going to put them to sleep on there. No. You just teach them. No. It's more of an education session. <laughs> of course. Okay, so you do this big assessment of their lifestyle, uh, their environment, the surrounding like family, partners, uh, children or parents or whatever they are in whatever position they are in the family. Then there is an environmental assessment. So how is your bed? How is your light, you know, light environment, yeah. noise? I guess you go through the whole process of uh, yeah. whatever external yeah. factor can affect them. Um, and then do you do, do you give them something like um, homework? Like, okay, you go home to diet, you have to try A, B, C, and then report back to me? How? how? What I tend to do, and people that are coming to me actually will say, look, I've tried this, I do this. And they generally have quite good sleep hygiene, but there might be just little things that yeah. they've missed out, for example. Um, so it would be quite often people are, are actually going to bed too early. Mm -hmm. So it would be a case of, and sometimes I recommend a, a period of sleep restriction. Right. So instead of lying in bed awake, fretting, desperately trying to go to sleep, I would suggest that actually they go to bed much later. Mm -hmm. So I do tend to ask that people have completed a sleep diary beforehand, so they've got right. a little bit of knowledge around what they're doing, what yes. time they're going yeah. to bed, yeah. how long do they roughly think they're for lying awake there for, what sort of time are they waking up in the morning, and then we tend to look at the amount of hours spent asleep, yeah. and then consolidate that down. So for example, if a client was in bed, maybe going to bed at 10 o'clock, and not needing to get up till seven, for example. That's quite a long chunk of time. Nine hours, yeah. But actually, they might only actually be asleep for five hours. Mm. And then, so we would look at really shortening that so that they're actually using all of their natural hormones, their sleep drive, yes. to fall asleep. And that then teaches their body and their mind that actually bed isn't a scary place. A lot of people with sleep problems are actually getting quite scared of actually going to bed. Yes. <laughs> because yeah. lying there ruminating doesn't feel very good. For an adult or a child. Yes. So, no, no, no. I appreciate so that. So it's very much... So the homework, I think, and to go back to the original question, would be a sleep diary, would be a knowledge of what's actually going on for them overnight. Okay. So you already mentioned you are working with a very broad range of ages. And so people come to you, as you said, you mentioned from seven months old <laughs> yes. all the way to... Do you have uh, people in their 50s, 60s or elderly... Yeah, yeah, I haven't seen many elderly clients, right. mainly due to the nature of reaching out from a business point of view. Yes. I've actually got a little local talk coming up, Yes, I'm hoping that I might get some elderly clients coming to. Again, okay. that is sleep knowledge, that is knowledge of their circadian rhythms tend to shift earlier as mm. we age. Yeah. Um, therefore, uh, an elderly client might be getting very, very tired in the early evening, quite possibly have a little nap, and then find that actually, because they don't have the same pressure that none of the same hormone drives as we get older yes. they then find it very difficult to fall asleep and stay asleep so it's a little bit of knowledge around how they can support their day mm. to then support their night and our elderly clients great okay um what is the typical outcome of people coming to you they sleep <laughs> i guess sleep is Yes. I've, what I do quite often is manage expectations as well. So it takes a while. You know, this isn't a magic process. No, but, of course. Um, would, so it is very much tend to be sort of four to six weeks, and yeah. then a client tends to report feeling much better. So little changes can have big results. I find. Great. Okay. Um, you already mentioned that you have a treatment which normally lasts one session. Is that the, a typical result so far in your experience? Yeah, yeah. Every now and again, if I've got a, a client that's particularly worried, yes, and they all want to come back for some reassurance to make some tweaks, because we don't always get it right in the first session. You know, there might yeah. be something that's overlooked or something else has cropped up in the process of trying to make some changes. But generally, people will manage within one session. Fantastic. Okay, well, sounds fascinating. I, I learned so much because I was literally expecting a process which would in, in involve many sessions and uh, a, a kind of a, a training process, really, of people go home and try maybe for a week certain techniques and then come back to you and uh, just fine-tune it rather than being 
Well, it's uh, fascinating. It's probably not good for my business. <laughs> okay, so uh, a couple of general questions about yourself as a person and as a profession. So, what is your relationship with patients? <laughs> I'm not naturally a very patient person. Um, professionally, I can be very patient because I understand what it is to be right. you know, with the client and being able to understand all of that. Yeah. In my personal life, I am. Not patient. I like to leap into things head first. <laughs> I get too enthusiastic. Okay, so <laughs> you were not patient in order to start this practice and you jumped into it? No, well, actually, no, because there are other factors holding me back in that one. So that, that took me a while to um, take the leap into private practice. And I'm still doing both jobs at the same time at the moment. So right. that is a very gradual process. Yes, okay. How... What is your relationship or how important do you think is having consistency in your work? Consistency in general is very, very important, I think, because human beings thrive on boundaries and consistency and social consistency as well. So I think it's a very important concept. Um, Certain aspects of my life I can be incredibly consistent about. when, When I know that it's important or I can see the benefits of sticking at something, and yeah, I can be absolutely consistent. Um, sometimes I do like to flip from one thing to another, so I do have to work on that. Yes. <laughs> but in terms of bringing up children, consistency is crucial. And also in terms of sleep regulation and our hormones and our cycles, yeah. consistency is also crucial. Yeah, great. Okay. And and then obviously now comes the question about the nearly the opposite. So <laughs> the adaptability and quick changing of direction. So what what do you think about uh, when it's time to sometimes quick thinking and change direction? Because obviously what you've been doing consistently for a long time yeah. might not be might not be working <laughs> might not be working anymore yes. or or ever. And therefore sometimes it's important that to say okay this doesn't work. I change direction. Yeah. Yeah, that bit I'm very good at. You are? I'm naturally good at thinking on my feet and being able to steer someone in a different path or mm. thinking, you know what, let's just try a different tact because we've got a little bit stuck where we are. Let's try something different. So it is, I do, I like that I'm quite good at being able to adapt. Great. And, and you have to, I think, as a therapist or a, any kind of professional, you have to adapt to the situation you find yourself in. Yeah. Everybody's different. Yeah, and also from time to time, things change. So something that worked very well maybe in 2015, today might not work. And, um, you know, lifestyle shifting, um, you know, there are lots of influence. And nowadays with internet and the fact that, you know, people are bombarded with the mobile phones and this sort of thing. So there's a lot of things that maybe five years ago, the general population were not affected by. And nowadays they are. So there is an increasing amount of... uh, an increasing need of uh, sometimes you say, okay, I need to take this decision, change that this direction. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. You're very right, actually, that there's been a recent sleep survey done by the um, mm. the Sleep Council, which actually looked at sleep about five years ago and last year. Yeah. And found that actually the general population's knowledge of sleep had increased, but actually their ability to sleep had decreased. Right. So you're very right. The knowledge is out there, but people don't necessarily manage to adapt themselves to it. Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. Okay, now talking about yourself as a, as a person within, within your profession, always, this is a question I always around your profession, but do you have a daily or weekly routine you apply to your, to your business? Um, to the business, well, I try and practice what I preach. <laughs> so I'm very consistent going to bed at the same time and I'm very consistent getting up at the same time. Okay. And only vary that very slightly at the weekend because that is what keeps us on track and sleeping well. So I do definitely go, go to bed at 11, wake up at 7. That's very consistent. Yep. <laughs> okay. Consistent. And any... Uh, this is more of a nightly routine <laughs> to some extent. So in terms of like weekly routine, so is there anything you do particularly every, say every Monday you do something in particular or, or, or anything else? It very varies on what, what my work is doing that week because at the moment I'm yes. juggling two jobs. Yes, so it yes, really yes, depends. Yes. I mean, obviously we've got school runs and, and childcare to factor, so that bit stays the same. <laughs> yes. Um, do you have any morning routine which is affecting you, the way you work? 
Um, well, what I'm actually getting very fascinated in is our relationship between um, our digestive system mm. and our sleep and then mood disorders. Right. So I'm actually trialing myself as a bit of a guinea pig, um, a, a long period of not eating over, so from dinner in the evening through to midday the next mm -hmm. day, I'm trialing a period of sort of fasting. Yes, because, intermittent fasting, yes. Yeah, so the new thing I think coming out this year is the timing of our meals, not necessarily what we're eating, yes. but when we're eating it and telling that quite individually. So I do find actually that makes me wake up with a much clearer head. And I can function much better. So it doesn't always work. You know, the, the Friday night chocolate and wine does come into it at times. So how it yes. it up. But I am trying. Okay. Um, do you have any... Um, do you do exercise? And if so, what exercise often? Oh, I love exercise. Um, okay. I, I'm a cyclist, so I love cycling. Every now and again I go for a little run, but cycling is the main one. We've also got two dogs, so I walk them most days. I don't exercise as much as I sh could do or mm -hmm. should do. Yes. I only manage about two to three times a week. Um, I but used with... to do mm. more because I used to get up early and do it. And then I thought, actually, no, sleep is more important. <laughs> so, well, yeah, there is a balance, you know, in, within 24 hours. So when you say you are a cyclist, because in Cambridge, Everyone. eight person, <laughs> eight people, nine people out of ten are cyclists in some way or the other. Are you a cyclist in terms of one of those with a proper racing bike that goes very long distance? I used to have a racing bike. I yeah, used to. You go long um, distances. I'm more of a, a mountain biker now. So right. I get more enjoyment out of shorter, more challenging rides. Yeah, but you go um, off-road with a mountain bike yeah. and do yeah. proper mountain biking, not yeah. just going around town, okay? No. I see. Okay. Right. Now, your business... Your practice, your your sleeping um, therapy practice is fairly uh, new. I know is in fairly fairly new. So where do you see yourself in three years from now in terms of developing this practice? I would like to have really reduced the NHS hours mm -hmm. and really upped the private practice hours. So yeah. there will be a certain number of hours I have to do, I think, in the NHS just to maintain um, that knowledge of my registration. Yeah. As a nurse. Um, so, but generally, I would really like to be mainly in private practice. Okay. I'd love to explore more the relationship with diet and sleep mm -hmm. as well. Okay. So, I'd like to explore that a little bit more. Possibly do some more motivational coaching that side of things. Fantastic. Um, I'd also like to develop the more um, sort of media presence. So, maybe webinars, maybe mm -hmm. um, YouTube channels. That's really new to me. Yeah. Um, more interactive sessions, perhaps. So, so going that way. I'm also starting to do a little bit of corporate work right. with small businesses. So mm. that's an area that's quite exciting to me. So to be able to go into a business and offer that support and knowledge. So I'm going to try and build that bit as well. Sounds fascinating. Uh, if you could give, like the last question I'm going to ask for this particular interview is, if you could give someone starting starting out some advice what would it be <laughs> i'm still very new myself it would be of course that's why you're fresh you remember <laughs> what you had to do in order to start yeah. it would be to play the long game i think to start off slowly stay enthusiastic about it keep that passion for what you're doing there and then don't underestimate how much man hours goes in without any return for that there's a lot of preparation and donkey work that you don't get any money back for um so just be prepared for that part of it very nice very very good advice i think is you're absolutely right i think a lot of people expect that they start something and they it just works and it just doesn't really <laughs> in reality is you have to try it and even if you go like to the most uh tested methodology and you go to the best school apart from the fact that most schools will not teach you how to market your business um, but it, I think uh, yeah, it's a it's a long term investment in 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 everything so Richard it's been really really interesting finding out um, about your practice because <clears throat> I'm an extremely good sleeper so <laughs> I don't think I will become one of your clients anytime soon but I think I know 
a lot of people who are struggling sleeping and I think uh, there is a there's a big need for people like yourself so thank you very much for the interview and thank you very much for the wealth of knowledge which uh, I hope people will enjoy and uh, maybe there some of them will contact you we will put your contact details at the in the notes for the for the um, for the show so people will be able to contact you at the end of it all right thank you very much thank you